Good evening, it's Thursday. Welcome along to Inside the Hive. We are live for the next hour from Vicarage Road with lots of great inside stuff from the club. Uh, coming up, we're going to look forward to Liverpool on Saturday. We've got an update from the eSports competition that happened at the weekend. Got your chance to vote for Player of the Month and Goal of the Month as well. We've got another 60-second challenge on the way for you and we're going to be adding another player to our Watford Greatest Eleven. Of course, you can get involved as always. You can ask your questions if you're on YouTube. Just pop them in the comments section below and on Twitter at Watford FC. Use the hashtag of Inside the Hive. As always, of course, can't do this show on my own. So I'm joined by the one, the only, the legend is Mr. Tommy Mooney. Tommy, how are you? Very well, thanks. Good evening. How's your week been? Quiet week, actually. Still no golf, but I am still. playing tomorrow morning. Still, are you going to still play in the snow tomorrow? Or is it going to brighten up tomorrow? No, it'll be fine. As soon as I get on the tee, it'll go sunny. It'll be good. It'll be all right. It'll be good. I'll see how you get on tomorrow. Uh, we're also joined by a gentleman who played with Tommy here at the club as well and made, uh, I think it's well over 200 appearances, the one and only uh, Mr. Micah Hyde. Micah, how are you? Good, Mike. Nice to be here, mate. Good to have you on the show with us today. Um, obviously, you two played together. Yep. Um, what was Tommy like as a player? Annoying, kept missing, kept being passing, <laughs> kept shooting. That was a pleasure. Obviously, it was a pleasure playing with him. So no, it's not. Believe his first. Look, I'm, assist <laughs> I'm assisting him again here today. So obviously, again, another assist. I'm giving. <laughs> Sitting there assisting him. No, it, was, it was good times. Yeah. Good times. And Tommy, Micah, good player, good lad in the dressing room. Good in the dressing room. Had his uh, very famous saying every time we went out in the tunnel. He'd say, "Let's go to work," and that clicked everybody in. And nice. The unity in the dressing room started without on a match day. Nice. And, and what's life for you now, Micah? Coaching and involved at QPR, if I'm right? QPR, yeah, coaching at QPR. I've uh, been doing it for three years. When I, would, when I finished playing, I, I'm fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to go straight into football again. So I've, I've really been in it since I've stopped playing, to be honest. Nice. Enjoyed it. And uh, well, we're delighted to announce as well that you are the latest player to accept our invitation to be one of our Hornets ambassadors as well. So, um, Great to have you on board with that. Obviously, Tommy's one of those ambassadors as well. You joined a whole host of, of, of great names and obviously for you to be asked something that obviously means a lot to you. Absolutely. It's an honour. It's just an honour to be part of that group of people, you know, So um, and be connected to the club still in that way. So, yeah, I'm, I feel privileged to be um, asked that and an honour to, to, to receive it, to mm. be honest. Yeah, Tom, we talk about the ambassadors a lot, don't we? We know how much you know you did yourself during, during the lockdowns and it means a lot to the former players to, to be part of that group. Yeah, it does, and like Mike, Micah says, there's, there's there's some names on on that list that have that have accepted the offer, and exactly the same as Micah, we're all delighted to be part of it again, and back, you know, to, alongside a, a club where we've thoroughly enjoyed being players, and we can go on and life moves in different ways, but we're still representing the football club, and that's the most important thing. Mm. Obviously, talking of legends that are on that list that you've added your name to, of course, when you when you joined the club, the the late great Graham Taylor was here. Um, Tommy's always full of great memories and so many guests that join us on the show have got really, really good memories of, of Graham Taylor. Um, what about for yourself? Oh yeah, um, very good memories with Graham Taylor. Graham Taylor, success started when I came here with us, so it was under him, so I'm um, fun memories and very glad that he saw something in me to bring me here to join a group of players and we went on to have a good time and if it weren't for Graham, obviously like Tommy said, paths going different ways, but I'm so fortunate that my path went that way under him. I've mm. um, got nothing but respect for the man and what, what he taught me mm. um, in football and, and in life in general. Mm. Yeah, we, we say this every time, Tommy, don't we? But it's just such a testament to him as a man and as a manager that every player that comes in that played under him just speaks so fondly of him. Yeah, absolutely. But also shows you, you have to bear in mind that this is a long time ago. The gaffer made every decision. So he's seen something in Micah playing for Cambridge at, what, 21, 22? Yeah, yeah. 21. And then brought him into the football club. You don't realise how successful a signing's going to be when you make that signing. But, you know, the gaffer gets plenty of plaudits for his coaching and managerial, but also he was a head of recruitment as well. So the amount of signings he got right and yeah. stayed at this football club for a long time, you know, is another string to his bow. Yeah, Matthew, we'll be glad that you saw something new at Cambridge. It means you're with us tonight in the studio. Um, it's been a couple of weeks since our last game, so let's kind of look ahead to obviously this weekend. Obviously that last game away at St Mary's at Southampton, no game the weekend after because of Everton in the FA Cup, and then we've had an international break. Um, Tommy, obviously, I guess we mentioned this the other week, you know, sometimes you want to get stuck back into that next game, but Liverpool coming up this weekend, lots of positives to take from that game into the weekend. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate the, that the Everton game was cancelled because, 
you could see just the lifting morale from the from the players. And and like we said on the show a couple of weeks ago, it could have been four or five nil up at half time. It ended the game two nil up, but we kept that clean clean sheet. You know there were some really good performances, two really good f finishes um, from Cucho. Even the first on his wrong on his wrong foot to slide it in from such a tight angle. And you want to take that 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 winning feeling. We talk about the. W a winning dressing room is the best place to be for a footballer and when they go back in there they probably had to wait for almost three weeks um, to then go back into a match day changing room so to go back in after an international break after that length of time and then to go to Anfield and, uh, and face one of the best teams in the Premier League it'll be really difficult for them but we've seen it happen before. Obviously, Mike, we've got players that have come back this week that have been on international duty. You know, you yourself, you're an international footballer playing for, for Jamaica. How did you find that coming back after an international break and straight into a game then on a Saturday? Um, it's not as easy as not going away to a break and going into a game. So it's, it's, it is a little bit transitional when you come back um, because obviously you've been away with a group of players. But obviously when you come back to your club, you're coming back to your regular players. So it, it is a little bit of a transitional thing, but nothing major. I think the most, as Tommy said, what he alluded to, I think the, the greater problem, not problem, would be the, the momentum, the stop of momentum. They've, they've won a game, played well, and now they've got to wait three weeks to get going again. And that would be more of a, a concern to me. It's like you said, it would have been nice if the Everton game would have been prior and not got called off. How but, did you find it, Michael, when you came back from internationals, that first day back at training, knowing that you've only got one, maybe two days preparation? Yeah, generally, you don't really do too much because they, they write about jet lag and stuff like that. So it's a mental thing with me really at the time when I come back you just look forward to playing the game the, the day after you come back really is just a day to acclimatise not so much the physical work not actually what you do on the pitch but just acclimatising yourself with everybody else and hopefully you, look, you go into the game with that same sort of vibe and that's how I found it it wasn't so much important what I did on the training pitch and stuff it was more just getting to you, getting to talk to the lads again getting around getting that camaraderie and just, just going to play on the game try our best to keep his feet on the ground when he came back in on a Friday. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you, what was it like when he came back from international duty? They missed me, they missed me. They all missed me. <laughs> yeah, we missed it. <laughs> we missed it. As you can tell, he was very shy and retiring. Today. <laughs> oh, so well, you noticed if Michael wasn't at the training ground, definitely. <laughs> um, obviously, we're going to talk more about those games coming up uh, in the next few weeks later on in the show, but momentum is so important. You both know what that's like from pushing for promotions and it's the same in this scenario now. It's a different end of the table, but momentum is key in this point right now. How, how important is that for the dressing room, the momentum in any scenario when you need to get the wins? Massive, massive. You know, if you get into a habit where you're winning games, fantastic. If you get into a habit where you're losing a game, it can be terrible. So momentum is very, very important and keeping that momentum and then trying to regain it. That's why this little three week break might not do us um, the favours that we need going into the Liverpool game. Mm -hmm. Momentum is a massive thing. You know, if you're winning, like I said, it becomes easier when you're winning. When you're losing, it's hard to grind out them results. So momentum is really, really big in football. Mm. Obviously, we had Ray in the studio last week and obviously Roy being the manager. Are they get get because he's from both sides because they've been that international manager that's taken players away and then then obviously coaching the side now in in the Premier League. Um, from a management perspective, do you think they've kind of they'll have everything in place? They know how to deal with international players coming back, which I guess is is an added bonus for us. Yeah, absolutely. But I I still think that the. The most important thing is the strength of characters in the dressing room. And yes, you've certainly got that with, with Roy and Ray um, in the way that they lead their, their teams and their clubs. But in the dressing room, you've, you've had that little gap where, like Micah says, you, know, you, you, you miss your mates a little bit with international football, but then you come back into it and you understand when you get to this stage of the season, you know, it's, it, it can be a scary time when you're... When you, you've got the task ahead yeah. that, that these current Watford players have got. So the, the more strength uh, uh, of character in that dressing room and the, the responsibility of the, the, the senior players to, to lead the younger players into going to Anfield as well. We've got a lot of, a lot of players in that squad who've never been to Anfield before. So it, for them, it'll be, uh, it'll be a first and it'll be intriguing and it'll be their dreams come true. But you've got to go and win there. No, you certainly have. As you mentioned as well in the last couple of weeks that those kind of final four home games are like a cup final. And, and Ray said last week, you know, we've got to do the bits on the pitch to get the fans behind us. But, Micah, the fans here, Vicarage Road, it's a special stadium. And when they're behind you, they're really behind you. Yeah, absolutely. 
12th man, as they say, when these fans are behind you. <clears throat> I can't see the fans not being behind them, regardless of what, they, what the outcomes on the day of a particular match. The fans will always be here. That's, that's the strength for the club. The, the fans are a massive strength for this club. So as long as the players go out there and give their best and look like they're trying their best, the fans will stick, stick with them and they'll be behind them. Oh, 100%. Um, while we're talking about Vicarage Road, um, any fond memories to any particular moments that, that stand out for you from your time here at, at, the, at the Vicarage Road? Um, I'm not saying corny. I hope not, but every 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 time I played for Watford, it was a special moment for me. That's the only truth. Um, it's probably the standout moment was when we, I think, I scored on the way for us getting promoted, and uh, my baby was born, my son was born in that week, and we'd done a celebration. So that that was probably a, a moment, a personal moment for me that stands out in a in a football career yeah. that coincided together. Mm -hmm. But every time I played for Watford, um, it was it was it was good. Oh, I enjoyed every minute of it. Nice. So yeah. yeah. We might have a little clip of that a little bit later on, so hopefully that'll bring back a few memories yeah. for you. Uh, OK, yeah. as we mentioned, then there's been no action on the pitch for the last couple of weeks, but that doesn't mean there been, hasn't been things happening here at the club, because last weekend was the eSports Premier League Finals weekend, and here's how the Watford boys got on. Right, we're into that second leg of Aston Villa taking on Watford. It is two goals to nil to Aston Villa. But can Watford bring something back? That first goal just there cuts the deficit in half. Let's have a look at some of the action that's unfolded during the break. Watford managing to score another goal. Yes, Tom Stokes bringing it back 2-2 two, two in that game just there against Aston Villa. And it didn't stop just there. Oh, no, it didn't. He managed to score another. Yes, I'm here with Stokes. Managed to grab him before he went off. 4-1. Well done. OK, so we're at the E Premier League finals today, playing in an exhibition match against Liv Cook and Lisa Manley. And my team is me with Foot Header. Uh, Foot Header and Lisa are FIFA pros, so they're going to be helping me and Liv battle it out in the 2v2, uh, playing FIFA in a little bit. Like I alluded to earlier, these are four very competitive players. If gaming's your thing and you want to watch the full highlights of that, you can go to our official Twitch account at Watford FC official to see the full set of highlights. Uh, time now then for the goal of the month competition. And here are your contenders. Chance for Kiko to deliver. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely magnificent from Kucho and Andes. The Watford fans stand and applaud. A goal of huge quality. Sissoko's done well, got the ball out from underneath his feet, they have won back. And that frantic finale could be on the cards. Still the danger, loose from Salasu as well, Kucho Hernandez, and he squeezed it in. to come forward and in spectacular fashion she pulls the goal back for Watford. They could be in trouble here for Tuka Dada. Was that a foul perhaps? She carries on. Must be a goal. And Kiara Miola gives Watford the lead. Good looking corner kick and it's missed in the middle and scrambled in on the goal line. Well, could we have late drama here? Watford sprinting back up towards the halfway line as Jenna Legg gets the strike.
What a great selection of goals from the month of March. Those are your nominees once again. you got until 5pm tomorrow evening to cast your vote. Go to watfordfc.com to do that. Uh, Tommy, good selection of goals there. Which one stands out most for you? I think you have to look at Hernandez. Goal against Arsenal for me, I thought it was really good technique. I have to say the two against Southampton were much more difficult skills than, than, they, than he made them look. The first one from a tight angle we've already mentioned. The second one, I don't think he sees the ball all of the way. Judging by his body angle, the way he hits it, he doesn't see it all the way. So that makes it an even better goal. So all three of those really could be winners. Do you ever score one like that back to goal overhead? I, I don't think I'd have got up if I'd have, if I'd have tried. <laughs> if I'd have tried that. <laughs> I wasn't that athletic, as Michael like, will tell you. Still been a bitch. <laughs> my, 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 most of my goals were, were like Kiara's and Jenna's there, just tap-ins from two yards out. <laughs> Those are the ones I like. <laughs> uh, how about for you, Micah? I have to, unfortunately, I'm going to have to agree with Tommy. I would rather say a different one, but I like the Arsenal goal. I thought that was a, was a quality goal. And all the goals were really fantastic goals, but I like that. The technique and the athleticism and the, the way he took that the first goal. It's quality goal. Good efforts anyway. So remember, you've got till five o'clock tomorrow to cast your vote on that one. Uh, time now for Player of the Month. Kiko to deliver. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely magnificent from Cucho Hernandez. Still the danger. Loose from Salasu as well. Cucho Hernandez. And he squeezed it in. It's in again for Cucho Hernandez to score again. Sissoko's done well, got the ball out from underneath his feet. They have one back. well to recover the ball here is Maria Ferrugia for three what a brilliant clearance off of the goal line Looking forwards here it's a really positive run but what a challenge that is perfectly timed by Megan Chandler Some great contenders in there once again for the Player of the Month. And same as before, you've got till five o'clock tomorrow evening to cast your vote on that one, watfordfc.com. Uh, Tommy, some good performances in the month of March from the nominees there. Yeah, I think obviously Kucho gets, gets the headlines with the goals that he scored, but the, the women's team have really picked up in form as well. So there's some outstanding performances throughout that month. Yeah. Mika, some, some good performances on there from, from what we've seen from, from the highlights reel there. And say positive performances from the women's team and... Kucho is definitely a contender in there as well. For sure. Um, definitely. Um, from what I saw there, there's some very good performances from all the players. Um, so it'll be a difficult one, I suppose, for anyone to choose from. No. But it was good to see there's so many good performances coming from the men and women. It certainly is. Uh, remember, five o'clock tomorrow is your deadline on that one if you want to get your votes in watfordfc.com. OK, don't forget, if you want to get your season ticket sorted for next season, 22-23, the early renewal offer, get yourself a great price on that one. If you do that, go to watfordfc.com uh, to get yourself involved on that. Chance for you to meet the players. There's going to be a signing session coming up at the Hornet Shop here at Vicarage Road, Wednesday, April the 6th, 2 o'clock. Get it in your diary, your chance to meet the players for a signing session. We've just said some great performances from the women over the last couple of weeks and you can go and support them on Sunday, 3rd of April, 3 o'clock kickoff. They're at Kings Langley. They're taking on Durham. If you haven't got your ticket for that one yet, tickets.watfordfc.com. And even more action this weekend. If you've already got your ticket and you're heading up to Anfield at the weekend, wish you a very safe journey up there at 12.30 kickoff. Tommy is going to be on the commentary as always and stay tuned to all the official club's channels 
for all the build-up and reaction to that. So, chance for you to meet the players in the club shop in uh, next week. Uh, but of course, it's been a difficult period over the last couple of years. And for the first time since 2020, we had a player visit last week. So this is what happens when Yuri Kuska went along to Warren Dell Primary. <laughs> My name's Kaylee Clark. I'm Deputy Head of Warrendale Primary School. We really have a lot of reluctant readers. Um, lots of our children don't really read at home a lot, so we were just really excited to get engaged with the book project and get the children reading more and excited about reading. So the Children's Book Project is um, a volunteer-led, very small charity uh, that takes books that children have grown out of and gives them to children um, who might not have very many books of their own at home. Watford um, brilliantly led our first ever Premiership book drive and amazingly we collected over 5,000 books from Watford's community, so, which is amazing. So um, we've chosen Warrendale School to be one of the recipients of the books um, because we know that they'll put on a really fabulous uh, book gifting event, a really joyful book gifting event with their children. They were really excited to show him the books they'd chosen. Not often I spend my Wednesday lunch times with a professional footballer. Yeah, no, it was really, really great, really exciting day. Boys Hello. Someone here to look at your Hello. Books. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Hello. Nice to meet you. Ah, oh, hi. So, you want to say free? There you go. That's right, yeah. I'm a mom. This is my, my surname. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi. Hi. Say hi. It's <laughs> mine. <laughs> Cheese. They're our nearest football club. Um, so lots of our families, lots of our children support Watford. Um, so that's a great opportunity for us and our children to excite them even more. Footballers love reading. Footballers like books. Um, so we're kind of sharing that with our children to excite them even more about reading. Thank you. Owls. Thank you very and, much. Um, to show, to say thank oh. you. So these, we give these owls, they kind of travel around mm -hmm. with our house. Oh, okay. So anyway, for your children. Oh, nice. so, um, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yuri Kuska there going out into the community. First players we mentioned since 2020 because obviously the COVID restrictions. Tommy, how good is that to see? Obviously a fantastic project around reading and books, but we all know how important it is for the club, for that family field to get out into that community. Yeah, exactly. And you, we, we know this football club is the family football club. And, you know, whether it's a school, a hospital, a, a local um, initiative around the community, you know, it's something that we certainly, during our time, were, were, were brought up on with, with Graham Taylor and the importance of being enveloped with the, the local community. So it's great to see the players back out in the schools. You know, we've done plenty of things with Dave Messenger and now Simona with the, with the support of liaisons um, through lockdown, but it's always great to see the players going out and visiting and seeing the smiles on the young kids' faces, great. Mm. Mike, a few as well, if you think you, you enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know, especially Christmas time when you give the prisoners out and you go to the hospitals and stuff, that's something I really look forward to. But yeah, second in, second in what Tommy said, it's, the players play a massive part in this community, the Watford, the Watford players do, so it's good to see them going out and interacting, especially with the young kids and stuff that support the club. So anything that the, the players do in the community is very positive and can be beneficial to the whole community. So it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, very mm. good thing. Now as our latest ambassador, I'm sure we're going to get you back out there as well, uh, working hard like we get Tommy going as well. So uh, Absolutely. No. Yeah, Absolutely. It's, it's important to it. Yeah, no, it's good to see you as well. So uh, nice to thank you to Yuri Kutska there for going out and doing that one. OK, uh, you would have seen throughout the season there's been a bit of a competition going on called How Smart Are the Hornets? Well, the final has taken place and here is a little sneak peek. Tommy Mooney played 288 games for Watford. How many goals did he score? Yeah. All right. Clevs, you're 31. 
31. 79. 79. The answer is 63. <laughs> ben. Are you ready? Yeah, go on. <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to go for your big fat head, all right? Me? Yeah. Go on, Oh, that was poor. That was poor. <laughs> My big fat head as well. <laughs> Can I just say, the highlight of watching that was Tommy's reaction when Tom cleverly said how many goals he scored. You weren't happy with that, were you? How rude. 31. <laughs> I got 24 in one season. <laughs> <laughs> and he even came on the show earlier on in the season as well when we were talking about your goal scoring prowess. I'm going to have a quiet little chat with Clevs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, of course, if you want to see the full version of that, just make sure you head to Stake social media channels and find out who was cleverest by the end. Was it... Uh, uh, ben or was it cleverly uh, find out um, on the social media channels there uh, we all know Tommy likes a competition uh, and you're currently joint fifth in our 60 second challenge I'm in a playoff spot you're in a playoff spot you're clinging on to it uh, is Tommy going to stay in a playoff spot by the end of today well it's time for our next 60 second challenge and taking it on today is Flo Fife I'm Flo Fife this is my 60 second challenge Thirty-yard screamer or solo goal. Thirty-yard screamer. Home or away games. Home. Skiing or snowboarding. Skiing. Fancy restaurant or takeaway. Fancy restaurant. Team you supported as a kid. Arsenal. Best stadium apart from Vicarage Road. Emirates. First goal. Probably for Arsenal under tens. First football boots. Uh, Predators. First car you owned. Uh, Volkswagen Polo. Match day superstition. Uh, everything's got to go on my right leg first and then my left leg. Teammate with the worst dance moves? <sighs> Rosie Committer. Long distance runner or short distance sprint? Short distance all day. Studs or blades? Blades. Worst thing about pre season? Running, fitness. Coach or train to away games? Uh, coach. Red sauce or brown sauce? Red. City life or country life? City. Worst teammate to share a room with? <sighs> Gemma Biggerdike. Penalty shootout in a final, would you go first or last? Last. Last minute winner or hat trick? Uh, hat trick. Ah, one! That's so annoying because I started on one. Don't know which one it was, but I started on it. It's clinging on. Tommy is clinging on to that fifth spot. I was worried for you, I'm not going to lie at the start. He was flying through the answers. She started really well, but fatigue kicked in. At about 25 seconds, so yeah. it's too I'm, much I'm detail. Too much detail. Some of the answers we all know. If you're going to play this game, short and sweet answers. So when it comes to your favourite movie, you say love actually, nice and quick. Then Let me it. explain, Michael, before <laughs> you <laughs> say anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was Christmas time. It had just been on the TV. It was the first thing that came. Tommy's favourite movie. Actually. Love oh. actually. Favourite <laughs> movie. <laughs> so I know what to get for end of season okay. present now. I get the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> okay, time to take these two now on a trip down memory lane. Uh, gents, I'm going to take you back to 1999 and a trip to Anfield because these two were on the same pitch and there may be a familiar goal scorer about to stick one in the back of the net to get a famous three points for Watford at Vicarage, uh, 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 Anfield. Sorry, Gents, let's get your memories on this one. Michael, let's start with you. The first thing uh, that was memorable, that was my first game um, in, when we got into the Prem. I got suspended for the first three, so for me it was a, it was a big thing. But it was the, the reception that we got. Oh, the reception we got was outstanding. You know, we, we started, it, and they sing the song, you, you back your hair, stand up. But the reception we got after the end of the game, we got clapped off. I will never forget that. The old stadium clapped us. Mm. It, was, it was a really good feeling. Tommy, you did well there, didn't you? Jamie Carragher with some short suds on. He slipped straight up and gave you in space. Tap in. I'm, I'm deadly from three yards. <laughs> I'm more disappointed with, with this one. I think I should have scored here. Who put I you just, in there? Oh, it was probably you, wasn't it? <laughs> you, so you should have put that yeah, in and made it last like 10 minutes a little bit easier. Try. We were sweating for 10 minutes <laughs> after you missed that. <laughs> I did try. <laughs> no, it was a great, it was a great day. We, I have great to one. say, Chris Day, who was in goal on the day, um, was, was outstanding, made some really good saves. And we had pretty much, very similar today, all sorts of weather conditions during the game, wasn't there? It was yeah. torrential rain, then it was brilliant sunshine at the end. Just one of those. It was our first win in the Premier League. It was my first goal in the Premier League. So, unforgettable day. 
and just proves you can go to Anfield and get three points. You mentioned earlier on, of course, that some of the players go in this weekend. It's their first trip to Anfield. Was that your first, either of yours, first trip to Anfield to, to play in a game? Well, I was a Liverpool supporter as a kid, so I'd be I'd done the tour of the stadium and everything. My dad had lifted me up to touch the the badge that I did touch after the game. I didn't want to touch it before, but when we'd won and took three points, and then I felt I'd earned the right to touch it as yeah. as, as a man size. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it was. It was it yeah. You didn't take your dad to lift you up after the game. <laughs> My so. parents were in the crowd oh, in, the away, nice. in, in the away end on that day. Yeah. So yeah, special. Yeah. How about for you, Mike? Was that the first time you played at Anfield? That yeah. first time, yeah, it's a special stadium. Anfield, you know, and you're growing up. Liverpool's a team that is always you always admire. So to play there, yeah, my first time, it was was really, really, really a good thing. It was a nice thing, and to win was even better. To be honest. Yeah. When when that goal goes in. And you score. Was, was it at the cop end or was it? Yeah, so, so scoring at the cop end, silencing those Liverpool fans. Well, that's actually when all the players jumped on top of me there, that's what was going through my head. I've scored at the cop end because of the history that, that, that yeah. my family uh, had with the football club. So, yeah, it was just brilliant. But then when you see the, the goal back, Pagey and Willow's tackle, I mean, they'd probably get arrested for that, <laughs> let alone given a, fr a free kick against them. Um, but just shows the, the desire and the character that we had in that dressing room to cope with everything that we did on that day. We had to sit outside the stadium for about 15 minutes. Do you remember on the yeah. coach? Because the, the, the Liverpool first team coach was coming in, mm. but we were in front of them. So they made us pull over to the side so they could go mm. in. And we were sat for 20 minutes with Liverpool supporters banging on the bus, yeah. saying how badly beaten we were going to get on that day. Anyway, it turned out different, but like Micah said, the reception that we got from the whole stadium as we came off the pitch, exceptional. Yeah, no, spe special moments, obviously special memories for you guys in your Premier League, especially for your first Premier League game and that, and that first trip mm. to Anfield as well. So the lads mentioned just a while ago that, of course, uh, some players going there for the first time. Uh, one of those will be Emmanuel Dennis, and this is what he had to say in the build-up this week. You're top scorer for the club so far this season. Do you feel pressure? I don't know. Every game, I just like... Sometimes it's like, yeah, I'm under pressure because I want the team to win. So I just want to impact the team positively, like contribute to the team. So, but I mean, I mean, as a football player, I think every game, you go in every game with pressure. So you just have to get used to it. When you start the game playing, running, it just goes away. So but it's normal. It's your first season in the Premier League. How would you describe it up until this moment? <clears throat> I don't know. For me, it's just, I don't see any wow in, in the season for me yet. It's just play football, it's just score goals, okay. But it's, I just I need more. So it's just every day I try to push myself. You can do more, 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 more. For me, I haven't done anything yet, to be honest. So, but it's just, but I really thank God the, the progress. So, I just need to continue working hard, stay humble, and just keep going. Did you have any sort of ideas or preconceived ideas about what the Premier League might be like before you came to it? Yeah, I know it's like it's physical, uh, big players, you know, it's a lot of running, which I didn't really bother about that because I love running. So, I said, okay. But it's just like it's more technical, a lot of good players. So you have to be really smart. You have to be quick in thinking and just. So it was. I was just like waiting to see. But I'm happy that I'm already here and you know, step by step getting used to everything. So it's good. And it's interesting. You feel like you haven't done much this season. You feel like you haven't had your wow moment. What type of moment is that you're looking for? I'm looking for like a big moment, you know. So I mean, to be the best in the league. So if I got cheap that, then I'll be like, oh, okay, wow. Well, well. Thoughts there of Emmanuel Dennis ahead of the trip to Liverpool this weekend. And of course, Tommy, the last time we were in Liverpool, we were at Goodison Park, picked up those three points. Obviously, nothing's impossible in the Premier League. Could well go to Anfield and get three points, but it's going to be difficult, especially considering Liverpool are chasing for that Premier League title. Yeah, well, very, very different circumstances. It was a fab fabulous result and a s fabulous second-half performance at Goodison Park earlier in the season. But it's interesting there, watching Dennis's his interview. 
I always found it incredibly pressured when you're the one that's expected to score the goals and he's in that situation now and I it, the, the the pressure used to make me concentrate a little bit more and I used to enjoy that pressure as I got older but as I was younger I struggled to to, to deal with it but that pressure is on his shoulders along with Hernandez and King because we need to score goals to stay in this division and win games so it's it's how they adapt to that Dennis is very laid back but I'm sure he'll be giving it all his all on on Saturday morning mm. Michael Tommy obviously joked earlier on about assists and bits and pieces but that pressure that Tommy's just mentioned there did that feed back into the midfielders because the pressure's then on you to give Tommy the right ball because you know he's the man you need to get it to to get the goals Kind of, but I think when uh, whatever position you're playing, you're under pressure to perform in your your given position. Mm. So uh, all you want to do as a, as a player playing in the middle of the park is make sure that you you run, you run up and down. That's the first thing. That's the first minimal requirement that you run up and down. But the second thing is, can you can you be creative? Can you create chances for your teammates? Um, so they, that that was my remit, and that's what I always wanted to do. So I used to love assisting if possible. So yeah, if he if he if you put him, if if I give him a chance, I'm expecting him to score because if he doesn't score, it, I can't get an assist. So that's <laughs> so we, oh, we and he would tell me that. And I'll tell him, well, yeah, yeah, and I'll tell him, I'll, like, I'll speak to him, we'll speak like that. So yeah. I think that's why our team at our, in our period was good because we had we weren't the best players by no, by no shape or form, but we had a, a spirit about us and an understanding what we was doing on the pitch. And hopefully, if the current team go with that same spirit, that same understanding, what they meant to do within their role. Then there's every chance they could get a result. Why not? Mm. As formidable as Liverpool are, it's football, isn't it? At the end of the day, so if they go in there and they take that kind of spirit into the game, you do your role, do your job. Hopefully, they'll, they'll get something out of the game. Mm. Obviously, you're involved in coaching at the minute, and mm. you're doing those bits and pieces. Obviously, taking on a Jurgen Klopp Liverpool side, the way they set up, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a challenge from a coaching perspective as well. Absolutely. You now you got to look at first of all, you got to look at their, their, their attacking prowess. There's five players there. They got their world class players. So you've got to do with two of them. I mean, there's another three that might come on and change the game. So you've got to be on your job. You've got to be making sure that you're, doing your, you're on your job. You've got to make sure you're concentrated. You've got to really make sure you're focused against a team like this. And also, you've got to think tactically, where do you want to concede space? Or do you want to give up the ball? How high do you want to keep the line? So there's lots of things we've always got to be thinking about, which I would be thinking about playing against a, a formation, a formidable front line, because that is where their strengths are. Not neglecting from their fullbacks, because their fullbacks are very good as well. But it's them, them front players, and he's added to that. For me, it's, it's a tactical thing now. What do you do? Do you stay high line? Do you drop off and concede space? So all of these things, are, like you said, as a coach, I would be looking at. So I'm sure Roy um, will be considering all these, these options and how they combat that and get the best result they can. Mm. We saw a way, obviously, at St Mary's that Watford made things tight. They frustrated Southampton. Do you expect a similar approach at the weekend? I think it will, just because of the, style, the styles of play. And what was successful at, at St Mary's was that they play a right footer on the left-hand side and a left footer on the right-hand side. Yes, you've got some of the best players on the world, in the world um, going to be playing on Saturday at Anfield, but you've got to draw them back into the pack. And you know that if they're on the opposite side of the pitch, it's very rare that Salah's going to go on the outside onto his right foot. He's going to come back inside. So your structure and your strategy defensively has got to be bang on point, but it's got to be bang on point for every second of every minute because these players can punish you. Mm, they certainly can. Um, let's look at some goals. Uh, let's go back to 2020. It was the last home game before lockdown happened. Uh, a victory here at Vicarage Road against Liverpool. A performance like this would be good, wouldn't it, at the weekend? Absolutely. Sounds I think as well for Ismail Asar coming back from international duty and, and having some minutes under his belt. Hopefully he'll be involved at the weekend. But it just shows you the confidence. So I think... It, some of, some of these young players, when they score one goal, they look a completely different player afterwards because they're playing with that confidence of already being on the score sheet. And we need that from the first minute of the game because we will get chances on Saturday. There's, that's, that's for sure. We will get two or three chances. It's whether we take them. Um, and to, to win the game, we're probably going to have to score more than one goal because keeping a clean sheet against Liverpool is very diff difficult. Uh, but we certainly have chances and that was a fabulous atmosphere. Uh, I remember watching it on, on TV. Great atmosphere, great for the supporters to get a win against Liverpool, but also for the players just to, to give them that belief that we're going to need until the end of the season. Certainly does. Uh, right, Roy Hodgson has been speaking to the media today and here are his thoughts ahead of the game at the weekend. <coughs> you mentioned that Watford are underdogs going into this game. I mean, for yourself, how, how difficult is it 
trying to get the players to execute the game plan against Liverpool's home forward line and also the, the width that they, they, they threat they pose out wide with the likes of their, their full-backs as well? Well, I mean, that's the question of preparing for what you know the opponents are going to throw at you. And if you're playing Liverpool, you know that what the opponent's going to throw at you is probably a little bit worse than some of the teams that you've played previously are capable of throwing at you because they are they are very, very well organised, they have very, very good players and as you rightly say, they they pose threats in certain areas. So if you seal off the, the central areas where they're very good at breaking through, you're going to do that at the cost of leaving a bit more space wide where they also have players who can profit by any space you give them. So there's no there's no easy answer to that question. You know what we can do really. Am I am I confident? I think the question was that the players will try to carry out any game plan that we we think is necessary. And it's a it's a fairly simple game plan. It's to deny them time and space in our final third, and to make certain they don't get into the areas where they want to get into. So that isn't rocket science as such. And I'm pretty certain the players will work very hard to do that. But at the same time. There's still going to be lots of situations in the game where the quality of the opponent may may scotch all of those attempts you've made to get your, your tactics right and you, to get your your team shape right because otherwise Salah wouldn't be scoring 30 or goals a year and Mane and these guys. It's uh, it's got to be something. We're not going to be the only team that will go to Liverpool with a plan to try and stop them. So, of course, reminder, if you're not taking the trip to Anfield, you can keep up to date with all the build-up and reaction on the club's official social media channels. And don't forget, of course, Tommy will be on commentary for that one as well. Liverpool versus Watford this Saturday, 12.30 kickoff. Time now, then, for Tommy's favourite part of the show, Ask Tommy. Uh, Mikey, you're in for a treat. You're going to enjoy this one. Tommy loves so. it. Uh, a little bit of fun. Uh, we're going to ask Tommy four questions now. We're going to ask you four a little bit later on. There's a fifth t question tiebreaker if it's needed. We've not needed it for a while, but we still ask it anyway because normally it's quite a good question if I don't say so myself because I wrote it and it's good. And it is cool. a good one this week, by the way. The fifth question. You've I'm looking forward to it. You've built it up now. It needs I have. to be good. You've I have. built it up. Uh, before we get on to that, I just want to say hello to uh, Alex Nangle who's uh, watching uh, live from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, you've dropped a question because we're going to be asking uh, some fan questions uh, very shortly as well. So hello to Alex. He's watching all the way in Atlanta in Georgia. Right, Tom, are you ready for this? I'm ready. Come on. Question start. one is always about golf. We've had a few exceptions this year. We've talked DIY, because Tommy's done a little bit of this year, but we're going to start with golf. Ready for this? Question one. In the World Golf Rankings, which is celebrating its 36th anniversary this year, of course, Scotty Scheffler has become the 25th player to reach number one. But is he the 8th, ninth, or 10th American to do so? You like your golf, <laughs> isn't it? Eighth, ninth, or I'm giving you options this week. So is he the eighth, ninth, or tenth American to reach number one? Nine's my favourite number. I'm going nine. Correct. One point. And he's also the sixth youngest ever to be. I don't care about number that. one. You got a point. It's a good start. Okay. Question two. After leaving Watford, which club did Micah join? Burnley. Correct. Two points. How many international appearances? Did Micah make for J uh, Jamaica between 2001 and 2004? 17, 15 17. or 19? 17. He's been on Wikipedia today. Correct, three points. I'm just a knowledgeable man. <laughs> <laughs> Micah made 643 club appearances. But how many goals did he score? 40, 46 or 48? That's got that many. 46. Correct. Tommy, four out of four. I am on fire. This is the first time ever Tommy's got four out of four. I love that. Is that was it too easy You're this week? You're absolutely ruined, aren't you? No, You're devastating. I like to see people succeed in life. <laughs> so I congratulate you for four out of four. Just slightly worried I've lost my touch as a quiz master because it was too easy. He's blatantly been on Wikipedia. <laughs> clearly. Clearly been on Wikipedia. You had them up on the screen me. earlier on. <laughs> oh, I'm just watching the show while I'm in the show. Oh, have, we put, have we put your stats up already? Hello. I thought we were saving that for later on. Oh. Okay, know. he's done his research for once. It's nice. Uh, right, time for the important questions now. These are the ones that you've sent in, uh, and please keep yours coming in. Uh, Micah, first question to you. Yep. Uh, the question has been asked uh, on Twitter a little bit earlier on. Uh, what do you think was your best ever Watford goal? Uh, 
I think it'll have to be the one at Bolton against Bolton. Yeah. I think um, just outside the box, I believe. I think, and then it just because it could come inside with my the feelings and personal feelings when the son was born. And I think once we scored that goal, we knew we was going to go and have a good good season. I think so. Yeah, I think that one. Mm. Uh, next question: uh, How did Graham Taylor and Ray Lewington uh, differ in their approach? Uh, Ray, Ray was more of a coach. Graham was more of a manager. That's the only difference. Both good people, very good people. Ray used to be more of a, you know, used to do the more the sessions and that. Graham used to dictate more. So he used to be more of a manager, pick the team, mm. do the team talk, galvanise us, motivate us. Nice. Uh, Tommy, this one's for you. Uh, this is, comes from uh, TaylorMade Army. In response to Tommy's comment earlier about Cucho's bicycle kick, do you remember scoring an overhead kick against Sunderland at home in the 95-96 season when we drew 3-3? So apparently you have done one. I know I used to try them a lot. <laughs> I can't remember one coming off. but yeah, Apparently, 3-3 three, three versus Sunderland. Thank you very much uh, to TaylorMade Army for uh, reminding Tommy of an athletic goal. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, final question for the moment comes from Charlotte. It says, what are your strongest memories from the 90-2000 Premier League season? Mine? Both of you will go to both of you on this one. Um, I'd, I'd say just the stadiums, you know, you know, playing at different, playing at these stadiums, these wonderful stadiums, you find these wonderful fans, um, and having the, the Watford fans behind you, supporting you and cheering you on. For me, I think, um, yeah, that that was that was fantastic. How about for you, Tommy? Yeah, I think just getting to the Premier League and playing in the Premier League for the first time, obviously scoring my first goal from a selfish point of view, but then it it turned sour for me. I was injured for a long time, and it was hard for me, even though I was on crutches for a couple of months to watching my mates struggling and, and not seeing them with smiles on their faces. That was mm. hard for me. Mm. How tough was that for you as well, seeing Tommy like that? Because obviously friends in the dressing room as well, when, when you've got that opportunity and you've got that moment and, and your mates got picked up an injury like that? Um, on a selfish view, extremely, because uh, like on, the, on a purely selfish view, when you've got first team players injured, then it hurts the team. So, you know, when you, any first team player that's not available for selection, it hurts the team. So. Yeah, for him not to be injured, not to be available selected, not to be pushing a striker and stuff like that, it hinders all of us. So yeah, it, it, was, it, weren't, it weren't nice to see at all. Mm -hmm. It's not nice to see any player injured, like I said, at any time, at any time. But when you're a first team player and a, there's a, a critical um, first team player and person, person not available, then it, it does hinder everyone, it has an effect on everybody. So mm -hmm. it weren't nice to mm -hmm. see, you know. Yeah, for sure. <coughs> Keep your questions coming in. Uh, another chance for you to ask yours a little bit later on in the show. If you're watching on YouTube, of course, just in the comments section below and on Twitter at Watford FC and use the hashtag of Inside the Hive. Time now then for another edition for our greatest Watford 11. Uh, this is how the side is looking so far. We've got our defensive lineup all sorted. We've got our first midfielder in there as well, Nigel Callahan, picked by Kenny Jacket. Uh, and uh, Micah, for you, you're going to be picking our first central midfielder. Uh, now, before we go to you for your suggestions, um, Tommy, it's only fair we give a notable mention to our guest this evening because Micah could well feature in this. He can't pick himself, so he won't feature this week, but definitely someone to be considered. Absolutely, yeah. It, very difficult for him to, to pick himself. You give me enough stick for picking Robbo at left back <laughs> just because we play golf together. So, pick no, his friend. I, th I think from, from Micah's point of view, I have to say the relationship that, that he had with Richard Johnson in that, that, uh, that era was, was pivotal in two promotions on the back. I'm claiming an assist for this goal with that little header as well. <laughs> <laughs> but he's scored some critical goals. I, you just knew, if I made a run, I knew the weight of pass would be right from Micah. It was very rarely over-hit or under-hit. Passing is, is a big part of a, a midfielder's game, as is goals and tackles, but you know sometimes overlooked. And I think that you see there, that this is after I'd left, but probably the only time I can remember you heading a mm -hmm. ball. Probably right as well. Imagine if you'd have been done that, done that more. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> uh, you'd have got more than your 17 caps from Jamaica that I've got correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matthew, and some great stats as well there, you know, um, your appearances and, and goals and obviously what you did for Watford. Um, let's talk about the role of a midfielder. Um, how much would you say it's changed from your time when you played? Um, it has changed somewhat now because you've got these DMs and CMs and FMs and... These, these labels of midfielder, for me, a midfielder is a midfielder, just an M, just a midfielder. So you've got to go box to box, you've got to be able to tackle, you've got to be able to pass, and you've got to be able to create chances and stop chances as far as the opposition is concerned. So for me, a midfielder is a box to box player that's, that can handle the ball well 
and creates chances and obviously stops the other midfield player. So it's somewhat changed now, the specialist roles now. I think Makaleli, when he came over, was the first one to really show us this defensive midfielder kind of role where it doesn't really just defend. And, and then I think that's evolved. But now we're starting to see it come back a little bit to how a midfielder, sh not should be, but you know, you're coming to see it all around midfielders now, going box to box and doing both sides of the, the job instead of just being specific or a specialist in one. Mm. I prefer a midfielder that can do both, to go some old school that way. I prefer a midfielder that can get forward and that does his defensive work as well. So I like, I like midfielders like that. And that's the, hence the reason why I've chose the person I've chose. Okay. Just over Jono, uh, reluctantly. Just over, you know. <laughs> cool. Um, well, we'll, we'll reveal who you've picked uh, in a short while. Let's okay. go through those nominations uh, that we've got then. Uh, so someone that hasn't quite made it, let's talk about Richard Johnson mm. and, and him as a player and what skills did he bring and what did you love about him as a player? Composure and reliability. So with me and Jono, we, I think we were the perfect foil for each other, I believe. And we had a good relationship on the pitch and off the pitch, which I suppose helps. But we were the perfect foil. So he used to bring the power while I was saying, I'll bring more to go. I would say. Um, I might be wrong, but I, that's, that's how I saw it. Jono, Jono was fantastic. Like I said, he was someone that was stood in the middle of the pitch and he was consistent, strong. Before I came, I think he wasn't really having a great time, but when we came, we, we seemed to, to gel quite immediately. Um, so yeah, that, that was, that was, it was really, really a formidable um, partnership in, in the years we played together and we had a tremendous success together. I think partnerships all over the pitch are key and I've already mentioned how how uh, important Micah and, and John O's role was. But then you, you talk about, uh, as well, spoke about my knee, knee injury in, uh, uh, in the Premier League season, John O got injured at Liverpool. So I remember leaving the, the dressing room when we should be elated, yeah. John O's on crutches getting back on the coach. So it's, mm -hmm. it's difficult when you see your mates like that, but yeah. John O with, without that knee injury would have gone on to, to have an even better career, I'm sure I know it. It curtailed him for a few few years later, but that relationship that Micah and Jono had, every one of the Watford supporters loved the way that they played together, mm. and, and so did the rest of the dressing room. Mm. Your next contender, Etienne Capu. Yeah, I liked him. Like I said, I liked midfielders. I could do both sides of the job, and I thought he was had a very impactful time in the midfield with us while he was with us. I thought he was a good player. Not towards the end, I'm sure. I think he might have drifted off a little bit, but why we say I thought he was impactful, good striker with the ball, similar to Jono in that essence. Because Jonathan could strike a ball, so he brings back memories of Rich, Richard Johnson when I saw Capu play. Um, so yeah, I liked him. I liked the way he got about the park as well. Liked a little bit of a tackle, but he really reminded me of Jonathan because he, he used to hit him from outside the box, and he could hit him as well. To be mm. fair, <clears throat> yeah, tactically very very good. I'm not sure I'd have got on with with Capu. I've got to be honest. I like midfielders that run around and and show their teeth. Um, so technically very very good. Undoubtedly, have success in in countries with a slower game for for me, but very very good footballer. Okay, we've heard some nominations. Pressure's on now, uh, as you would have seen with the team at the top. We've we put your name by your selection, so it's forever immortalised. We'll forever know that Tommy just picked his best mate. Um, <laughs> for you, who are you picking to go into our Watford greatest eleven? Decore. Nice. Just ahead of Jono. Like I said, you just ahead of Decore. Decore is someone that, like I said, I like midfielders that can do both sides of the job. I like midfielders that do midfield stuff. I like midfielders that can try and get hold of a game and not be bypassed. And I thought he was, he was while he was with us, he'd he done very well. I did. I thought he'd done really, really well. If we got into the box, in both boxes, decent on the ball, good athletic, um, creative at times. So I liked him. I liked him a lot. Um, yeah, just slightly ahead of Jono. Unfortunately, mm. just slightly ahead of Jono because Jono would have been my number one midfielder in there. He has all of the traits that we've talked about already, um, and I'm I'm sure. You, can you imagine that the Korean with Jono and Micah in a three? Mm. You know, the, you've got every attribute in all three players there, and I agree. You know, Jono for me was is up there as well, um, but the Korean is a top top player. No, he certainly is. Well, uh, let's take another look at it then. There is Abdullah. The core eight is in there, selected by you. Micah Hyde, your name is in there. And uh, we'll be picking the final four players over the coming weeks as well. And we'll see how that team lines up come 
the end of the season. Now, talking end of the season, uh, the games are going to start coming thick and fast now. Four very important home games on the way. Let's take a look at that fixture list. Of course, Liverpool away this Saturday. Then you've got a home game against Leeds United, the home game against Brentford in there as well, home to Burnley, uh, home to Leicester City and that Everton game as well, at home as well. There's some vital fixtures in there, some big games. Um, the time we've been reflecting on this the last couple of weeks, but regardless of the result of the weekend at Liverpool, there's got to be positive aspects from the performance to be able to take into that Leeds game because you've got those Leeds, Brentford, Burnley teams in and around there. They are those cup finals. Well, three out of the next five games, certainly, uh, are almost must-win games because of the position that we've, we, we find ourselves in um, sitting here going into April. So it's, it's vitally important, you know, and the staff talk about four cup finals. I genuinely think there's, there's nine cup finals there. And we know that in the big games, we've picked up results where we weren't expected to. And the first ones that come to mind with the performances are Southampton, Aston Villa and Everton. You know, tough, tough, tough games. If we can pick up points on the road and then win our home games, then we've got a great chance of staying in a division. Mm. Michael, when you're playing a team that is battling for the title, you know, and, and you, you know going into that game it's going to be difficult to beat, can, can you leave a game if you lost one of those and, and see the positives or does it still hurt, is it still frustrating, even though it's one of those games you're going into where you know what the challenge is? Immediately it's going to hurt, but you've got to be pragmatic. You know, it's just a game, isn't it? So the, the, next, the, next, the, the home games we've got after that, Leeds, Burnley and uh, Brentford, they're, they're vital games for me. So as long as they go out there and, and, and hopefully get a strong performance, they get a strong performance against Liverpool, because let's, let's not, not silly people here, it's, Liverpool are a strong team. So hopefully we can get a strong performance, performance I'm talking about. If you get a result, fantastic. But we've got to take that into the next game. The home games are really, really vital for us. And I think they're exciting as well. Mm. I look at that, I'm excited by that. I'm, there's a chance. Yeah. You know, look at the home games, we're at home against them teams in and around us, there's a chance. So for me, to take the Liverpool game, get going again, and then hopefully see where that takes us and really grab them games at home. But it's about the skin of the teeth. I'd be born disappointed as a player if I was in the squad now. If we didn't get signed, as an actual player, if I didn't get signed out of the Leeds game, I'll take a loss against Liverpool as a player. And if I didn't get signed out of our home game, then I'll be really disappointed as a, as a player. Mm. Looking at those fixtures, well, we've got that Everton game still to be uh, confirmed when that game's going to take place. But potentially that could be a really massive game for both sides. Yeah, because we know it's not going to be after the Chelsea game. So it's going to be fitted in there somewhere along the line. It'll probably be, probably be our only midweek game um, between now and the end of the season. So there's a full week to focus on every game. Uh, and I agree with Micah. You know, it's, you, we have to take something positive from Anfield. If it's not points, it's performance. And, and the, the levels of concentration that we then take into the home games, which are must-win games for me. And, you know, here at Vicarage Road, I can many, remember many occasions where we've gone into big games here at Vicarage Road. The crowd get behind you, then the players take the crowd. When they, There's an automatic lull after 15, 20 minutes if there's no goals. But the, so then the players lift the crowd again and it's, it's like a, a revolving ball. Players and crowd just maintain that atmosphere and hopefully you get the result at the end of it. Mm. Tom, you just mentioned obviously a week to prepare for these games. How important is that like, for you as a player? Obviously, if you've won a game on a Saturday, would you prefer having a midweek game or having that time to prep when you need to get the points and you've got games that are like cup finals? Is that an advantage to have a week to prepare? I just love playing games. Mm. I, I, I didn't want to be at the training ground because there was no winner and loser and I like winning. <laughs> So I wanted to play every Saturday, every Tuesday or Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the week, we, if I had to wait six, seven days for another game, it was a little bit difficult for me to keep my concentration levels. I like that midweek game. Now, players don't tend to, to like playing as many games because they, they get a little bit more tired than we used to. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's probably a difference in a player's mm -hmm. mentality now is they're, they're happy to have a week. So hopefully that will benefit us coming mm -hmm up to the end of the season. Mm. I agree. I like to play more than train. I don't know if we've got a midweek game, I love that. You know, it's Wednesday off, come back Thursday, a little bit back again. So you're just playing, you're playing, you're playing. It's competitive, sharpens you up. So I prefer that. But as Tommy said, um, I think players are a little bit different now and they, they like a little rest in the week. And, and hopefully it will suit us. <laughs> hopefully it will suit us. Have a week for preparation win. Have another week preparation win. So hopefully 
it, it will suit us going into these last these last games. Mm, certainly, fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. um, right, near the end of the show, time now for your questions. Okay. As we play Ask Micah, and then we'll finish up, of course, with some of your questions as well to round up with the show. So, Tommy scored four points. Which is my highest score. Highest score sure. ever. You're under pressure now. So, no pressure. Okay. Hopefully, I've made these easy enough. Please. Question one. In 1997, you signed from Cambridge to Watford, but who signed you? Cambridge to Watford. Graham, Graham Taylor. Correct. One point. Okay. In 2009, Lovely. you joined which conference premier side? In 2009? Yeah. Conference premier side? Yeah. Just don't repeat the question, just answer well, it. <laughs> 2009, conference premier side? Begins with W. Conference? Watford, no. No, 2009. No, I was not thinking, what, 2009? But that's the, first, that's the first time you well, actually I couldn't showed the answer. I wasn't there long, that's why. I was only there for like a month or two. That's why I completely forgot yeah, Woken, sorry. Correct. Two points. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I wasn't there long. Do you know what? I, I went to Barney. I, I went there a little bit. Barney, I went... Tommy even knew that one. <laughs> um, I think a conference league or two. Anyway, sorry about that. I don't know what hope I've got for these last few questions now. Uh, question three. You made 17 appearances for Jamaica. Yeah. You scored for the team in a 3-0 victory in a World Cup qualifier. Oh, Correct. We didn't need a selection on that one. Love that. Correct. Three points. You made 34 Premier League appearances for Watford, but how many goals did you score? I, got a clue. I went really once a row, but I, only got, I ain't got a clue, to be honest. Give you some options. Give me some options. Two, three, or four? Three. Correct. Four points. We actually need Thank the tiebreaker. See, I'm not a striker, so I don't really count my goals. Yeah. Count, count the assists. assists. Yeah, the assists. assists. Okay, tiebreaker question. You've got more than me that season. <laughs> 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 okay. Three, you did. Okay. Know? Tiebreaker question. Go on then. There is more than one famous footballing Micah Hyde. Yeah. Micah Richmond Hyde is an American footballer and he plays safety for the Buffalo Bills. Yeah. But from this very seat, as the crow flies, how far is it to the Buffalo Bills Stadium in New York State? Now, Tommy's going to give me an answer and you just have to go higher or lower. All right. Tommy, the answer is between 3,000 and 4,000 miles. As the crow flies. You know I like to win. I'm going tactical. 3,500. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get higher, higher. higher. He's gone higher. So it's got to be 3,000. Uh, uh, so you just get to go off. higher. That's yeah, right. higher, fine. Higher. So basically, 3,500 and lower, Tommy wins. Yeah. 3,500 and one, you win. Yeah. The correct answer from here to the Buffalo Bills Stadium in New York State is 3,500. Oh, no. Get in and this. Sandy. Getting that training, this is that training. That <laughs> <laughs> training game. Sad, I'm like, <laughs> Tommy, you, Tommy got four out of four and still couldn't win us, Tommy. But it's a valiant effort this yeah, week, Tommy. I'm actually Definitely. fuming. <laughs> I am actually fuming. Because you said to me before the show started, I've got a really good tie break. That's a great tie break. That, I don't think it is. Because I've just lost breaker. again, Michael. I've just lost. <laughs> but, well, we, I'm going to have to let you win like last week. Like, no, I don't, I don't want charity. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a guest there. I'm a new guest. You've got to let the guest in. Exactly. Yes, I'm new to this. You've got to let the guest in. Right, let's finish up then with the important questions, the ones that come from you. Really appreciate them. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to send them in. Uh, first question uh, now comes from Pidge. Micah, who was the best player you played with at Watford? Uh, Tommy, obviously, being near the top, I would have thought. Richard. It's because of our partnership, not only because we played together in the same middle of the pitch. So Richard Johnson probably be my best player I played with. Yeah. Next question comes from Anwar. Uh, toughest player you ever played against? Lee Hendry. Okay. Not the most beautiful on the ball because he ran around all. The he ran around the whole pitch the whole day, and I had to track him, and I, therefore I couldn't get on the ball. It's just annoying. So he wasn't a difficult player. I didn't really play against any difficult players. They was all good players, but I didn't see any of them as being difficult. Just him, because he ran around all the time. It's mm. better if they just stand in the middle of the park and we just have a little one-to-one -one and you have it and I have it. But he just, I'd say that running around the whole, mm. the whole 90 minutes. So he, difficult one. Yeah, good answer. Uh, next question comes from Pete. Love this one. Thanks, Pete. Uh, a question for both of you. Uh, who was the most unsung member of those promotion-winning squads in the late 90s? I'll let you say this. I think if we, we should be saying the same person here. But I'll let you go first. Chamber. I wouldn't have said that. I would have said palms. 
Palms, yeah. Because Palms played in every position. But it wasn't yeah. really unsung. But in our change room, he was. In our, in, in our change room, yeah. he was, weren't he? Yeah. He was. He was in our own actual change room. But the, 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 I mean, he, he ended up wearing every shirt one season, didn't he? He ended up wearing mm. even a goalkeeper's shirt, played in every number of shirts. So, yeah, he, he probably was the unsung out so in my yeah. interest at that time. It's a difficult one to answer because we, we just had, well, it's the best dressing room mm. I ever played in. You know, the fact that we have, you know, a group chat 20 years later, it just shows you the intensity that we had. And you see how much me and Mike want to win a quiz. Yeah. Imagine what it was like on a five-a-side in, in, at the training ground or even better on a match day on yeah. a Saturday afternoon. It, we just had that intensity from every, every one of the squad. It's true. Every it, one of the squad. It was unbelievable. It was. The, 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 the intensity we had going into games and people like being... Having ownership and having to do your jobs, and if you don't do your job, it's, it's not, it's not going to be like you can't just come in the change room and be all smiling and that. It ain't going to be like that. It wasn't like that, was it? Mm -hmm. Not at all. Like everyone was accountable for their roles. Centre off, right back, striker, midfielder. It was really good. What was the secret to it? Was it was it GT sure. and just the players that you put together? You just knew those characters were going to gel, or was it just be, both? It's got to yeah. be. It's got to be the characters that he bring into the change room. We, it's got to be intrinsic what these people have, and then for him for him to tap into it and see it. So I'd say both because like it's very important what Tommy said about recruitment. Very important. He chose players to come, and if he didn't make it, he went in that changing room very long. If he, if, he, if he wasn't the right kind of person, he wasn't. You'd be there season, and then you have to move out of the way. He'd bring someone else in. So, and the ones that had the longevity, obviously, the ones that he he believed were the con. He was he was proved right. But I'd have to say it was both. Yeah, I'd have nice. to say it was both. Nice. Uh, final question uh, it comes from Katie. Says, it's great to hear uh, Michael you're coaching at QPR. What does the future hold? Could you ever see yourself going into management? I would like to. And then I've, I've got no, I've got no limitations of what I would like to do. Of course, because I'm working at a youth team level now. I played at a senior level, at a good level. I would love to put my skills, my wits against other people at that level. So yeah, for sure, I've got. I would. My ambitions are to to be a manager, mm. if possible, given the nice opportunity. Time. Micah, thank you so much for coming in. No Pleasure to have your company on the show tonight. Tommy, thank you to you as ever. Always good to have you here every single Thursday. Massive thank you as always goes to you for joining us tonight. Thank you for sending in your questions. If you're travelling up to Anfield at the weekend, uh, have an incredibly safe journey out there and get behind the lads uh, this weekend. And of course, if you're going to support the women on Sunday as well, make sure you get behind them too. Have a great rest of your week. Enjoy the weekend and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>